Welcome to this episode of the Voice of Victory podcast, recorded live at the campus of Victory Baptist Church in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. We hope the message today from Pastor Chris Nolan is a blessing to you. Before you begin listening, I invite you to grab your Bible and follow along. Now, let's join Pastor Chris. Set for worship and for the Word of God this morning. If you take your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Philippians. Uh, Philippians chapter number 3, as we continue our study in the book of Philippians this morning. Philippians chapter 3, our text is verses 13 through 21. Remember, the book of Philippians uh, was written by the Apostle Paul uh, to the church at Philippi while he was in prison in Rome. And he is writing them in order to thank them for their support and their gifts and for their encouragement while he was there in prison. And he is also writing to them to give them some practical instructions on how they are to live in joy amongst themselves. That's the theme of the book of Philippians, and that is joy. Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 21, is our text this morning as we'll be talking about the joy of pressing on. The joy of pressing on. The scripture says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have for us an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, And now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Let us pray. Father God, as we open up your word this morning, we thank you for the wonderful time of worship that we have experienced today as we have been ushered into your presence. Our hearts have been softened. Our minds are now open. And Father, we are ready to hear from you. And so, Father, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit. And as your word is preached today, we ask that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish what you desire for it to accomplish today, that it would bring conviction, that it would bring change. And, Lord, that when we leave this place, we will be equipped and better servants of you, ready to serve you during this week. And we give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as we experience the joy of knowing Jesus, as we talked about last week, we must continue in that joy by pressing on. You know, the Christian journey is one that is filled with unspeakable joy, yet it is also filled with many ups and downs. You see, you and I are pilgrims in this world. We are not citizens of this earth. Instead, we are citizens of a heavenly kingdom. Uh, We are not citizens of this sin-cursed world. We are citizens of God's kingdom. And as we live in this foreign land, we serve him, we serve the kingdom as ambassadors of Jesus Christ to this world. And as we go on this journey, there are many ups and downs. It is an adventurous journey, but yet it is a joyful journey. And as we look at Philippians 3, 13 through 21, we learn of several things that pressing on requires in order for us to continue on this journey. Because you see, sometimes when we get caught up in 
the turmoil of this world, many times as believers, we feel like throwing in the towel. We feel like just giving up or giving in. But I'm here to tell you this morning that we are too close to the end to give up now. Amen. Jesus is coming soon. We are very close to the finish line. And so therefore, we must press on. And here here in this passage in Philippians chapter 3, we see these things that is required of us in order to press on in this journey as ambassadors of Jesus Christ to this world. Notice, first of all, in verse number 13, that pressing on requires humility. It requires humility. Verse 13, Paul says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. Now think about this. Here is the great apostle Paul. One of the greatest believers of all time, one of the greatest missionaries of all time, the, the Apostle Paul, who wrote many of the books of the Bible that we study. He has given us many instructions on how we are to live and how we are to conduct ourselves in the house of God. And so here's this great Apostle Paul who says, I have not arrived. He says, look, I'm not at the end. He says, I don't know everything. Paul realized that there was still more for him to learn. Paul realized that he was still on a journey. Paul had a sense of dissatisfaction. He was not dissatisfied with Jesus, but he was dissatisfied with himself. He was not where he wanted to be in his Christian journey. Warren Wearsby says this, He says that a sanctified dissatisfaction is the first essential to progress in the Christian race. A sanctified dissatisfaction. You see, if we want to truly grow in our faith and in our walk with God, we must be humble enough to realize that we still have much to learn. The very moment that you come in your life where you think that you have arrived, that is the moment that you will fall. Because you see, spiritual pride is the downfall of many believers. And if we're going to press on, then we must be humble enough to recognize the fact that we still have a lot of growing to do. Amen? We need to have a spiritual, sanctified dissatisfaction action about us to the place where we realize that, you know what? We just can't get enough. We need more of Jesus. We need more of his word. And the closer we get to him, the more we realize we still need more of him. And the more we know of his word, the more we realize that there is still much more that we need to know, that we need to learn. We need to have such a humility that we get to the place where we recognize the fact that, hey, we're still growing and we still have a long ways to go. It doesn't matter where you are on your Christian journey. It doesn't matter how young or old you are, there are still things that you need to learn. There are still areas in your life in which you need to grow to become more and more like Jesus. So in order to press on, it begins with that humility, that sanctified dissatisfaction, understanding that I have not apprehended, I have not arrived, there is still much more to learn. Pressing on requires humility, but also notice in verse number 13 as well, pressing on requires dedication. It requires dedication. Notice Paul says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before Paul here continues in verse 13 by stating that though he has not arrived, he is dedicated to forget the things which are behind and to press on toward those things that are before him. You see, pressing on requires a dedication to continue to grow. I ask you this morning, are you dedicated to your Christian journey? Are you dedicated to the sanctification process that God is bringing you through? Are you dedicated to that? 
You see one who is dedicated to his Christian journey, who's one who takes seriously his time with God in prayer and in the study of his word. It is one who takes seriously his involvement in the church. It is one who takes seriously his involvement in the mission to which he has called. I ask you this morning, are you a dedicated Christian? Are you committed to pressing on? Notice Paul says that there's one thing that he does. He says, I haven't arrived. I'm not where I ought to be. But he says, this one thing I do, I forget the things that are behind, but I reach forth to the things that are before. You see, in order for us to grow in our walk with God, in order for us to be dedicated on this Christian journey, then we must learn to press on to what God has before us. We must learn to let go of our past, and we must learn to seek those things that Christ has prepared for us. We must reach ahead. We must reach reach before us to what God has before us on this Christian journey. We need to let go of the past and we need to hold on to Jesus as he carries us through this journey of life. Pressing on requires such dedication. You see, here's the thing. If you've come to a place in your life where you say, pastor, you know what? I I know the Bible. I've studied it backwards and forwards. I've been a Christian for many, many years. I've served the Lord in the church, in the community for many, many years. I've gone on mission trips. I've, I've led many people to Christ. And I'm at a place in my life, Pastor, where, you know what? I, I'm, just, I'm just here. You know, what more can I do? What more can I do to, to move forward? Let me tell you something. If that is your attitude this morning, if you have an attitude of complacency, if you have an attitude of spiritual satisfaction to where you, you're satisfied with where you are in your walk with God, you're comfortable with where you are in your walk with God, you're okay with the status quo, you're okay with just going through the motions, you've just become complacent in your walk with God. If that is your case, the truth of the matter is you're backslidden. You say, Pastor, why is that? Because the kingdom of God is always moving forward. And if you're standing still, then technically you're going backwards. Because God's kingdom is always moving forward. It's always advancing. So if you're not advancing with his kingdom... If you're not moving forward with his kingdom, if you're just sitting with your, where you are, then technically you're going backwards. Paul says that he was dedicated to move forward. He was dedicated to keep on going. He says, I haven't arrived. I'm not where I ought to be. And so I forget the things which are behind. I let go of the past and I focused on what is before me. I reached for the prize of that high calling of God in Christ Jesus. As he says in verse number 14, he says, I move forward. I am dedicated to continuing on this journey. I ask you this morning, are you a dedicated Christian? You must have a dedication in order to press on. In order to press on, you must want to grow. In order to press on, you must have a desire to know him more. In order to press on, you must be dedicated to your spiritual growth. Pressing on requires humility. Pressing on requires dedication. But then notice in verses 13 and 14... Pressing on also requires focus. It requires focus. Notice he says again, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth to those things which are before. And then notice verse 14. He says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. In these verses, Paul describes how he is reaching forward to the things that are ahead and he is pressing toward the mark, which is Jesus. You see, focus is the key. In order to press on, then we have to have an unwavering focus. We need to have tunnel vision to where the only thing that we see is Christ alone. We need to have blinders on our eyes so that we're not looking to the right or to the left, but we're simply looking toward Jesus. 
You know, Satan oftentimes dangles the attractive things of this world in front of our eyes, toying us and daring us to take a bite. However, we must be disciplined and we must stand firm and we must keep our eyes on Jesus. You see, the moment that we get our eyes off of Jesus, that's the moment that we fall. Satan wants to distract us. Satan wants us to to lose our focus. Satan wants us to look to the right or to the left rather than simply looking ahead and looking toward Jesus. He wants to distract us with all types of different things, things that may be good, things that may be uh, even holy or right or just. He wants to distract us with our good works. He wants to distract us with our religiosity. He wants us to distract us with our traditions and our spiritual compliance. Complacency. He wants to distract us with those things. Why? So that we would not see Jesus. Because when we see Jesus, that's when things start happening. Amen? That's when people start getting saved. That's when life starts getting changed. That's when revival breaks out. So if he can get the church focused on all the other things around them rather than on Jesus, then he can keep us from being the church that God would have us to be in the community. Amen? And so therefore, We need some spiritual blinders. We need to guard ourselves and keep ourselves from looking to the right or to the left. And we need to simply focus on Jesus. It reminds me of Peter when Jesus was walking on the water. And you remember the story. Jesus is out there. The the disciples are in the boat and there's a storm that is raging around them. And the waves are are crashing against this boat. And all of a sudden, they see Jesus walking on the water. And of course, the disciples are scared to death. They think it's a ghost and they're afraid of, of what was happening. And so finally, Peter cries out. He says, Jesus, if it's really you, then beg me to come out on the water with you. Jesus tells Peter, it is I. Come on out on the water. The water's fine. Come on in. And so Peter gets out of that boat, and lo and behold, he is walking on top of the water. And as long as his eyes is on Jesus, he doesn't even notice what's going on around him. But the very moment the Scripture says he took his eyes off of Jesus, he saw the wind and the waves. He saw the storm around him, And the moment he began to look at the storm, instead of looking at Jesus, what happens? He began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And then Jesus comes and gets Peter by the hand and pulls him up out of the water. And he says, Peter, you have such little faith. Now think about this. You and I are going through this journey on this earth, this this Christian life that is filled with many ups and downs. And sometimes there are storms that rages in our lives, storms of doubt, storms of fear, storms of frustration, storms of bad health, storms of financial difficulty, storms of of indecision, storms of division and disunity, and all those different things that creeps up around us. And oftentimes, what do we do? We start looking at the circumstance. We start looking around us. And when we look around us and we look at the circumstances, we begin to sink and we drown in the storms of life. But if we just learn to keep our eyes on Jesus, then we're not going to be worried about the storm around us. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, we're not even going to see the storm. When we keep our eyes on Jesus, we're not even going to see the circumstances or the trouble or the trials that is around us and that is raging in our lives. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, Jesus, then we can walk above the storm and we can walk above the heartache. We can walk above the fear. We can walk above the doubt. We can walk above the sickness and the disease and all the pain and suffering that we endure in this life. If we just keep our eyes on Jesus, then we can walk above the storms of this life. So pressing on requires a focus. We've got to focus on Jesus. As you've heard me say many times, it's not about you, it's not about me, it's all about Jesus. And if we just keep our eyes on Jesus, then everything is going to be okay. 
No matter what goes on around us, no matter what happens in our world today, no matter who wins the election, let me tell you something, it doesn't matter as long as our eyes are on Jesus, amen? Because if our eyes are on Jesus, then everything's going to be okay. And so we've got to have that focus. Pressing on requires a focus. It requires a dedication. It requires humility. But notice a fourth thing that we see in these verses, and that is that pressing on also requires discipline. It requires discipline. Verse 15 and 16, it says, Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. The Holman New Testament commentary says that as followers of Christ, we are responsible to live out or put into practice what we have learned. We are not perfect, but that is no excuse not to run the race and seek the prize. God is calling us to the victory stand, and we must run as hard as we can to cross the finish line. You see, pressing on requires discipline. If you look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 24 through 27, Paul describes this Christian journey as a race. And he says this, he says, Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. In other words, run so that you can win. Uh, as you get to know me, you will find out that I'm a very competitive person. And when it comes to playing games, I play to win. My wife says I cheat. I just say, no, I win, all right? Uh, I do what it takes to win. Paul says, if you're going to run a race, then you run to obtain, amen? Uh, you, you don't just run it just, just to run it. You run it in order to win. You want to cross the finish line. And so he says, every man that striveth for the mastery, every man that striveth for these things is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. In other words, when, when you're an athlete, and you're, you're exercising, and you're working out, and you're practicing, and you're running that race, you are, your desire is to win that trophy, to win that crown. But that crown, that trophy, is an earthly crown. It's an earthly trophy. It's a corruptible crown. But Paul says this spiritual race that we are running, we are running so that we may win an incorruptible crown a crown that will last throughout all of eternity. And so in verse 26, he says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now, what is Paul saying here? Paul is saying that as I run this race, so that I may obtain the prize, pressing on toward the mark, which is Jesus Christ, keeping my eyes on Jesus. As I run this race of life, I am disciplining myself. I am disciplining my body so that I may run well. You see, runners must discipline themselves with a proper diet and good exercise in order to be able to run well. Paul says that our spiritual journey also requires such discipline. We are to keep our bodies in subjection. We are to live untainted by the world, and we are to be filled with the knowledge of God's Word so that we may run the race well and enjoy the prize that awaits us. Pressing on requires discipline. Several weeks ago, we preached a message on uh, spiritual exercise. And if you recall, we talked about where Paul said that we're to work out our salvation, which means we don't work for our salvation, but what it means is we have to exercise our faith. And we shared with you seven spiritual disciplines or seven spiritual exercises for life. 
They included things like Bible study and prayer and meditation and church attendance and witnessing and all those different things. And so I would encourage you, if you did not hear that message, you can go back online. You can listen to one of the podcasts or watch it on YouTube. But uh, I encourage you to apply those spiritual disciplines those spiritual exercises to your daily life. Because you see, to run the race well, you've got to have such discipline in your life. You've got to have that spiritual discipline to continue to run the race and to run it well. Pressing on requires discipline. There's another thing that pressing on requires, and that's seen in verses 17 through 19. And that is that pressing on requires discernment. Pressing on requires discernment. Notice he says, brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Here in these verses, verses 17 through 19, Paul warns us to be mindful of those who are enemies of the cross. He teaches us to have discernment and to choose those who who we follow wisely. Ellsworth writes this, he says, Getting to know God... Well, is a difficult and demanding business. What should we do when we find ourselves facing a challenge that seems too difficult for us? He says, we should do what the unsure guest does when he is at one of those fancy dinners and he doesn't know which fork to use. We should find a role model and do what that person does. Have you ever been in that situation? where you're at this banquet and you're looking around and you don't know, you've got, you know, four, four or five forks there. I never understood that. What's the purpose of that? And so what do you do? You look around the table and find somebody that looks like they know what they're doing and you do what they do uh, so that you can do it right. So what is Paul saying here? Paul says, look, be careful who you follow. Be careful who you pattern your life after. You need to have discernment. You see, many Christians have been led astray because they've been listening to the wrong people. Many churches have succumbed to discord and division that hinders the cause of Christ in the community. Why? Because they listened to the wrong people. You know, it is a sad reality that you cannot trust everybody who claims to be a Christian. Amen? Just because you go to church with them doesn't mean they're necessarily the right role model. You need to find somebody that has 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 demonstrated the example of spiritual growth. You need to find somebody that that has been at it for a while. You need to find somebody that is mature in their faith, that is knowledgeable of the scriptures. You need to find somebody that sets an example of holiness and purity, and you need to follow them. Paul says that to the church at Philippi, he says, look, don't follow the example of those who are enemies of the cross. Don't follow the example of those who will lead you astray. Paul says, instead, follow me because my eyes are on Jesus. Amen. We need to follow those who has their eyes on Jesus. We need to follow those who have proven themselves as spiritually mature and they are growing in their faith. We need to have discernment in order to press on. We have to have a discernment about who it is that we listen to and who it is that we follow. The sermon is needed to press on lest we fall to the wayside. The servant is needed to press on lest we become complacent in our walk with God and we just simply stand still and we become stagnant. We need to have discernment in who we listen to and who we follow. Pressing on requires such discernment. I ask you this morning, who are you listening to? Who are you following? Who are you paying attention to? Who are those that you are following their example? This past week, I had the privilege of uh, joining our senior adults at a senior adult luncheon, and we had a great time. And by the way, we have some great senior adults here at Victory Baptist Church. 
And I encourage our young people, and I'll, I'll let them know in the second service this morning as well, is that, look, you need to look at these senior adults in our church, and you need to, you need to follow their example because these are guys that, hey, they've been through it. They, they, they've been through life, and they're growing in their faith. And one of the things that we want to do is to, to have discipleship mentors, and, and that is to pair uh, people that have, uh, are strong in their faith with new believers and to help them in their new walk with God. But we also hope for that to be an ongoing thing. So in other words, not just for new believers, but really for all of us. We, we all need a mentor. We would all need somebody that we can follow. We all need somebody that can help us in our spiritual journey. And so we, what, what we want to do is to create an environment here at Victory where our, our senior saints that, that have been growing in their faith for many years that are setting the example of holiness and right living, that, that know the Word of God, and to pair them up with young people in our church that they can mentor, that they can guide, give them somebody to follow. Amen? I would encourage you, senior adults, don't just complain about the way the young people are today. You know, the biggest thing we say, well, you know what, this generation today... You know, they're, that's not the way I grew up, you know. Man, them young people today, they're, they're really messed up. Hey, stop complaining about the young people. Stop griping about them. Instead, help them, amen. Take them by the hand and guide them and encourage them. Set a good example for them and how that they are should live. Those young people need those types of leaders, those type of mentors in their life. And so, therefore, as a church, we need to have discernment. If we're we're going to press on, then we need to have the right people to follow. Amen. If we're going to press on, we have to have the right people to listen to. Who are you listening to this morning? Who are you following? Pressing on requires that discernment. So Paul tells us to press on, press on with humility, press on with dedication, press on with focus, press on with discipline and discernment. But then notice finally this morning, in order to press on, it also requires expectation. It requires expectation. Notice what he says in verse 20 and 21. He says, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Notice that there are those, in verse number 19, who mind earthly things. There are those that are focused on this world, and they have no expectation of heaven. But Paul here reminds us that our conversation or our citizenship is not of this earth, but it is in heaven. As one commentator said, the unworthy Christians mentioned in the last verse mind earthly things. But our city, our country, our home is in heaven. There is the state of which we are citizens. There is the general assembly and the church of the firstborn whose names are inscribed in the role of the citizens of the heavenly city. Our real home is there now. Amen. Our citizenship is in heaven. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19 says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. You see, as believers in Christ, we are the citizens of the kingdom of God now. We are citizens of his kingdom and we are foreigners in this land, on this Christian journey, as ambassadors of Jesus Christ to this world. Therefore, we are not to mind earthly things. Instead, we are to live for the kingdom. We're not to be concerned about our lives on this earth. Instead, we're to be investing in the kingdom of God. We're not to be concerned about our own comfort or our own uh, future on this earth because our future is not here. Here, our future is in glory. Amen. We don't need to be concerned or caught up in all the, the turmoil of life and all the debates and politics and all those different things that we see.
see in our world today. Instead, we need to just focus on Jesus. Why? Because we're not citizens of this earth. We are citizens of a heavenly kingdom. And our expectation is for that kingdom. As the old preachers used to say, we need to keep our hands on the plow and our eyes on the sky. Amen? Keep on serving the Lord faithfully with the expectation that we are going home. You see, we have a promise from God that we're going to be changed. Paul says our sinful, vile bodies will give way to a glorious body. In one place it is written that this corruptible is going to put on incorruption. This mortal will put on immortality. This body that is prone to sickness and disease. This body that is prone to death. This body that is prone to temptation and sin will one day be changed. The scripture says that in a moment in the twinkling of the eye, at the last trump, you and I will be changed. We will be given a glorious body with no sickness and no pain and no heartache and no sin and no temptation and no death. And King Jesus on that day will subdue all things and he will rule and reign forever. Church, this is our expectation. This is why we need to press on. We need to press on because we have a hope, amen? We've got something to look forward to. We've got something to to live for. We must press on through the pain. We must press on through the suffering. We must press on through the persecution. We must press on through the confusion. We must press on through the doubts. We must press on through the fears. We must press on through the disappointments. We must press on on through the temptations. We must press on through the heartaches of life. We must press on through the victories and the defeats. We cannot tire. We cannot grow weary. We cannot give up. We cannot quit. Why? Because we have a hope. We have an expectation. Our redemption draweth nigh. Church, I'm here to tell you this morning that the trump of God is about to sound. Jesus is coming soon. It is forth and goal at the one yard line. We're a about there. We're about to cross the finish line. We're coming around the last turn. We're on the straightaway. We see the finish line. It is in view. And so therefore, child of God, don't get discouraged. Don't get wrapped up in the things of this world. Get your eyes off of the circumstances and get your eyes on Jesus. Don't give up church because we're almost home. Amen. That is our expectation. That is what we have to look forward to. And so therefore, we must press on. Amen? Press on. God has us here for a reason, church. And that's to reach the lost and dying world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is our purpose. That is our mission. That is what we must focus on until Jesus comes. The question this morning is simply this. Will we succumb to the pressures of this world or will we press on? Will we throw in the towel when we are discouraged or will we press on? Dear friend, we've come too far to give up now, amen? We've come too far to throw in the towel. We must press on and be the people and the church that God has called us to be for His glory. And let me tell you something, that will bring us great joy because there is joy in pressing on. I'd encourage you this morning to stand with your head bowed, your eyes closed as we begin to pray and meditate on these things and we'll have a time of invitation. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, let me encourage you with this thought and that is simply this, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how terrible your sin is. Jesus still loves you. You say, pastor, you don't know what I've done. Well, you don't know all the things that I've done. And I'm telling you this morning, if God can save me, he can save you. Amen. If he can save the apostle Paul, he can save you. Amen. And so if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, let me tell you something. Your sin has separated you from God.
The scripture says the wages of sin is death, separation from God throughout all of eternity in a place called hell. But there's good news. The Bible says that God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we are still sinners, Christ has died for us. So that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, your citizenship is not in heaven. It's, it's still on this earth. I would encourage you to join the kingdom of God today. Amen. Put your name on the dotted line. Become a member of his kingdom by putting your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. At just a moment, our pastors will be standing here in the front and you can come to where we are standing and we will direct you to someone who can take a Bible and show you how you can be saved and how you can know it. And you can leave from this place today assured that you are a citizen of heaven, amen? And you can press on with the rest of us. If you're here today as a Christian, you say, you know what, I, I, I've been discouraged lately. You know, I've been, I've been watching the news. I've been looking at social media and it's depressing when I see all the turmoil in the world. And I must confess, it's, it's gotten me down. It's gotten my eyes off of Jesus. Maybe just wanna come and kneel and pray this morning and say, Lord, help me to get my eyes back on you. Help me to stop looking at all the turmoil and all the confusion and all the storms of this life. But Lord, help me to experience the joy of pressing on. Help me to see you this morning. Father God, we thank you for your word and we thank you for your truth today. And Father, we pray if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would convict them right now in this very moment. Father, that your Spirit would be heavy upon them, that you would soften their hearts, that you would open their minds, that you would break through those barriers and those strongholds, and Lord, that today will be the day that they would say no to themselves and yes to Jesus. Give them the courage to come this morning and accept you as their Lord and Savior. Father, we pray for us as believers. Help us not to get discouraged. Help us not to look at the circumstances or the storms. But Lord, help us to keep our eyes on you. Help us to press on with discernment. Help us to press on with discipline. Help us to press on with expectation of a home waiting for us in glory. Lord, help us not to give up, but help us to continue the work that you've called us to. And we give you the glory and the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. As we sing the altars open, you come. Do business with God this morning. We hope you've been blessed by this week's message and invite you to join us soon in person on the Victory Campus. Worship schedules and other information can be found on our website at bbcmtj.org. Please visit it today. Have a great day and we'll see you soon.